Hey, what up everybody? This is Stevie Breach coming to you with a uh, review on The King of the Ring from 1993. I watched this on the WWE Network. One of the very most awesome things you guys could be going out there and watching. Just do, you know, diving down into the, uh, the history of all the WWF pay-per-views out there. I'm always a big fan of tournaments. Uh, wrestling in its time has put on a lot of good tournaments and a lot of bad tournaments. And this was a, a really special pay-per-view to me as a kid. I remember... Um, thinking that, um, you know, from watching WWF superstars growing up, that uh, I thought it was really cool that almost everybody in this tournament had to fight a, a match uh, on, on superstars in order to qualify into it. It was a way to see a lot of the top stars wrestle other semi-top stars in order to get them in. Like, uh, I, I believe Lex Luger, uh, who was fighting as the narcissist at this time, he had to have a match against uh, um, Bob Backlund. That's a, that's a match that... Uh, I remember in my mind, uh, they ended up not qualifying for the tournament due to a uh, a brawl and a double countout. Uh, Shawn Michaels and Crush, a match that was on pay-per-view, was a match that was on Superstars as well, um, trying to get them into the tournament. Uh, you know, It was just a very fresh, very cool idea. This was coming off of WrestleMania 9, uh, where they had the, the, the... I think as time has passed by and people have looked back at it, the very horrible finish to a semi... It's not really re reviewed well that well. I think ma mainly because I was a kid and I have special feelings for it. Uh, WrestleMania 9 is always a fun show to me. But to a lot of people, it is just a, it's a show full of horrible screw job finishes uh, that, that are just all over. Just don't give it any merit. And the way that it finishes uh, with the big buildup of, you know, uh, Yokozuna coming in as the number one contender to fight Bret Hart because of the win at the Royal Rumble. Um... And then at the finish of that match, we just see Hogan come down. Hogan challenging Yokozuna to a match. Or I guess it was really Yokozuna challenging Hogan to a match. And then Mr. Fuji jumping up, throwing the salt in Yoko's eyes, seeing the big boot. And within seconds, before anybody knew what was happening, Hulk Hogan was your WWF champion again in 1993. I mean, this is the same card he was on where he was in a tag titles match, uh, going up against Money, Inc. with uh, um, uh, the barber. Um, just, it's it, it's just weird to go from being the number one contender to the tag championship to winning the WF championship on, on one card. And I know Beefcake, you know, isn't the biggest superstar of all time, but, you know, Hogan was the main draw of of that match. That That is one of the, the, the things that everybody came to see. Um, but, you know, just basically the, the plan at the time, if you really break down to it and go into the sheets, was that, you know, Vince was trying to, you know, put a spark back into his company. You know, you can look at the attendance of this King of the Ring show that was held in, I believe, Dayton, Ohio. Only 6,000 people. Uh, probably one of the least attended WWF pay-per-views of all time, or at least from the 80s on. Um, just how they were only able to draw this many people, especially on a show um, that had Hulk Hogan uh, in a... Uh, I guess you can say a, a co-main event slot. I mean, um, because of you know all the controversy that was going down at the time, uh, it was hidden. You know, in the in the middle of this card, um, I can't even. It was the sixth match on the card, which is a very weird spot for uh, Hogan to be. Um, but you know, they had the tournament. They can't really you know have something built around you know, finding out who the king of the ring was and, and not really have that be the, uh, the go home to the show. Um, but more than likely, if Hogan was playing ball and, and he, he was doing what he was supposed to be doing, which was taking the championship, sparking up some house show numbers, um, and, and getting the belt to SummerSlam and putting Bret Hart over and making him the real deal um, for Vince and for Brett and the, uh, you know, the WWF universe at that time to be moving forward and sort of, you know, picking up where Hogan sort of dropped the ball off um, by not really finding a person to pass the ball to um, along the way. Um, basically, it just you can read Brett's book. Um, it, it probably best puts it, you know, that was the plan all along was to do Hogan versus uh, Brett. Hogan didn't want to pass the ball to Brett for if it was reasons that you know, Hogan didn't like Brett. Hogan didn't think Brett was the right guy. Hogan didn't want to, you know, sort of end it on that note. You can say what you want to. I love Hogan, but 
it, it probably wasn't the best decision of his of his career. But then again, in 1993, everybody thought that Hulk Hogan was was done. I mean, that he was just gonna maybe go off, make some movies, make some commercials, and we'd never see him wrestle again. We never thought that he would go to WCW, you know, relaunch his career with the NWO, come back in 2002 and have another run, and you know, be showing up at WrestleMania 30. Uh, all these years later, it's just uh, you know weird. But this was a good show. It's not a great show, um, but uh, basically, you know, because of the controversy and everything like that, um, you know, everybody that had to to wrestle um, their way in, you know, Jack Tunney sort of said, you know, okay, Yokozuna's gonna fight Hogan for the championship since he was the last champion. Uh, Brett, they feel bad for him because he uh, he lost his. Um, is right to a rematch because the the champion lost the belt before he even got a shot uh, to go back after it with a rematch. The tournament was sort of set up around Bret Hart. He was the number one seed into the tournament uh, for the reason, you know, they wanted to make sure that he got something out of it. There was no promises as there was later, like when you go to, uh, I think, King of the Ring 95. Uh, that was won by King Mabel. He got to move on and become the number one contender for the championship at the SummerSlam. I don't know if that was really set in stone or if that was just was the storyline that they pushed along the way. Um, but, you know, there was no promises on what you would get out of the deal other than being the king of WWF. Uh, this was set up sort of like it was the first King of the Ring tournament of all time. But the King of the Ring was a tournament they had run uh, on house shows to sort of spike interest in the... Uh, uh, in the uh, they always did them at this one uh, venue, but I can't remember which one it was. Not MSG, uh, but it was a certain show they normally ran as the King of the Ring show. And uh, Macho Man had won it. I think Harley Race had won it. Junkyard Dog had won it in the past. So there had been past King of the Rings, but since this was the debut of a new pay-per-view built around it, they acted like it was the first one. Uh, the first match of the night was Bret Hart against Razor Ramon. Uh, th this match was mostly just to see Bret Hart get beat up, uh, so as the storyline would continue, you know, Bret wasn't going into these next few matches fresh, because in order to win, win the King of the Ring, uh, the way it was set up with a tournament of, um, I guess that'd be 16 guys? No, 16 guys. Yeah, well, however, however many guys are in there, you would have had to fight three three times in order to, to reach the, uh, the the finish and, and be crowned the King of the Ring. You would have to win three matches. Um, Razor was the first uh, you know per perfect opponent for him. At this time, he was still wrestling as the heel. Uh, they, this was years removed, but people still remembered uh, the match there where Razor Ramon challenged uh, Bret Hart for the uh, WF Championship at um, the Royal Rumble. Um, so, you know, this was a good match. It was a rematch. And, um, you know, Razor really took it to Bret. He got the uh, the overwhelming, you know, first sort of first blows. Uh, it came to, you know, Razor Ramon trying to give uh, Bret a suplex off the top rope, trying to end it all. Um, Bret just landed right. He was able to roll Razor up. And even though he was beat up, he was able to get the, the pin in about 10 minutes. Uh, an awesome match, an awesome way to start the show. Uh, from there, we went to uh, Mr. Perfect Wrestling against Mr. Hughes. Uh, not a lot of sense was made out of this match. Mr. Hughes beat the shit out of Mr. Perfect, and then out of the middle of nowhere, he took Undertaker's urn, which was the storyline at the time that he'd stolen the urn from the Undertaker, and clocked Mr. Perfect upside the head. Ref saw it, called the DQ, and Mr. Perfect was able to move on to the next round. Bam Bam Bigelow and uh, Jim Duggan had one of those matches that I, that I hype up, much like the Big E versus... Uh, Rusev match for the upcoming pay-per-view, Money in the Bank for WWE. Just two big guys throwing each other around. Uh, Bam Bam was able to injure uh, Duggan in, in this match, and he was just able to wear him down to his, where he was able to get the three count. Uh, Tonka and Lex Luger, when I first saw this match was on this card, I was really thinking this was going to be part of that blood feud, which I think would be almost a year later. Um, you know, it's never really looked at as one of the best feuds of WWF's history, but if you were living in that summer, Tonka and Lex Luger a year from now, uh, when it was built around, you know, who was the person that was turning heel, who was the one taking the million dollar man's money and sort of being a, uh, a double agent, I guess you can say, for the baby faces in the baby face locker room. Everybody was pointing fingers at Lex Luger thinking he was turning heel and it ended up being Tatanka uh, was switching over and he became a part of the Million Dollar Corporation. Uh, it just sucks that you know Tatanka was such a guy that was sort of looked at as like a future of the WBF. Uh, yeah, that heel turn sort of killed him and it never really picked up again from there. Uh, but these guys went out there, they were competing and they just couldn't get the job done. 15 minute time limit draw. Um, because of this time limit draw, neither one was able to move on um, because of this Bam Bam Bigelow. 
advanced in the next round because he didn't have an opponent. So that would line Bam Bam going all the way from the opening round all the way to have a guaranteed shot in the finals. Um, from there, we went to um, the semifinal match between Bret Hart and Mr. Perfect. Uh, so many things can be thought about, you know, because uh, in the pre-match promos, uh, Mr. Perfect told Bret he still owed him one from SummerSlam 1991, even though it was two years ago. He was still fresh in people's minds. One of the greatest matches I think I've ever seen. And some people even picked this King of the Ring match over it. Um, when I was watching this, I really did like the match for the one fact of there was the uh, the time limit draw, even though um, for some reason... Uh, uh, Wikipedia has the match listing as 18 minutes and 56 seconds. Maybe that's counting the intros because the whole thing was built around 15 minute time limits as we saw or maybe they just they fucked up and they were hyping it up and they just never really rang the bell uh, and the guys just went long because they were feeling it out there. But um, um, yeah, now I feel stupid. But the, the reason why I really like this match as well is that um, you know the, the announcers are hyping it up. They have to get this job done. Instead at SummerSlam, they're going out there and they have as much time as they needed. They could have wrestled for an hour. They could have wrestled for two hours. Uh, just as long as you found somebody to find out who the Intercontinental Champion was, that that's all that mattered. But in this one, if there was a disqualification, if there was a count out, if there was a draw, something like that, if they weren't able to get this done, Bam Bam Bigelow was moving on and not only was he going to be uh, advancing in the, in the tournament he was going to win the tournament because they couldn't find a, another opponent for him so um, you know, Brett and Perfect were really giving each other uh, like he said not as great as the SummerSlam match but still really really good uh, Bret Hart was able to get the um, the pin on Perfect and, and move on uh, to the finals from there and there from there, we have some uh, filler matches in order to get Brett some rest in order to get there. And the more time that Brett's getting rest, Bam Bam's getting just even more. Um, Yokozuna and uh, Hulk Hogan had a match with just basically no heat. Nobody really cared about it. At one point, uh, a Japanese photographer jumped up on the ring in order to get a picture. You always see Jap Japanese photographers at Yokozuna's matches outside on the thing, but you've never seen one climb up there. And this one had a big, huge gimmick camera, uh, like from the 40s, maybe the 50s, whatever it was. And then this one, you know, took the picture. It shot off a ball of fire that went into Hogan's eyes. Uh, the screw job was on. Hogan got rolled up by Yoko. Uh, the one, the two, and the three... And that was the last we saw of Hulk Hogan in uh, WWF until 2002. Uh, he would ride off into the sunset, say goodbye. Yoko would be the new champion that, that's moving on, and that was the direction that WWF was pushed again. Uh, there was an eight-man tag involving the Smoking Guns, Steiner Brothers, Head Shrinkers, and Money Inc. Nothing really to say from there. Uh, and then you had a match for the Intercontinental Championship with Shawn Michaels versus... Uh, Crush, Diesel was on the outside. Crush wasn't able to get the job done. Whenever I look at Crush... That guy would have been the most awesome uh, uh, intercontinental champion. I, I don't know. You know, Crush left there, went on to become Brian Adams. Uh, with Brian Adams, he became a part of Chronic. He did find a place later in, in late WCW. He saw that when WCW came back in WWE, they did get a run, but it was one and done for some reason. Um, Brian Adams and uh, I can't remember the guy that was his partner in Chronic just... They didn't have a good running in WWE, and it just was down from there. In the finals, we saw Bret Hart beat Bam Bam. I'm sorry, Bam Bam Bigelow in the finals, um, and uh, from there he moved on. And what would be setting up the next big angle for Bret the Hitman Hart, if he, if, as he wasn't going to be in the championship run anymore, and they needed something running for him. Um, he was, you know, presented with the crown, the scepter. They put the the, uh, the uh, robe on him. Uh, Jerry the King Lawler came out and attacked him. Uh, basically saying that he was the only king of wrestling, and and, and um, you can see Brett just laid out on the ground. Um, you know, Brett, it was uh, I think he got struck with the scepter and struck with the hat, uh, just sort of taking it away. But nobody really wanted to see King Brett the Hitman Hart from here on out. But I don't think anybody really could see what was coming with the uh, uh, Brett Hart versus Jerry Lawler feud. Most people probably would think they would just have one match. They would go on to uh, SummerSlam. Uh, of course, you know, at SummerSlam, Jerry Lillard, King Lawler played chicken that he didn't want to fight him. Uh, he had uh, Doink the Clown come out there for him, and uh, Brett beat Doink. Uh, and then Jerry jumped in and tried to hit him with his crutch because of that Gorilla Monsoon said that the match must go on. Bret Hart versus uh, Jerry the King Lawler, and then they had the Kiss of My Foot match, and, and this, that, and the other. It was a big stepping stone for Bret in his career. Even though he wasn't, like, the champion, he still was in a big-time role for WBF. Um, as in a major star that people really wanted to see and people really wanted to get behind. This was an awesome way to kick off the King of the Ring shows. I'm sure that I'll be watching more of these down the road. I know a lot of them get really, really bad. Um, but uh, Bret Hart, 
more than likely one of the best King of the Rings of all time. Um, this was a good show. Highly recommend you guys should go check it out on the WWE Network. $10 a month. How do you not have this?